The other is moving right now from Singapore to the Gulf of Mexico to drill for Chevron for five years. Implementing metrics and accountability process to, so that everybody knows exactly where they stand at all times. Establish the vision to get people rallied around that vision to set expectations that are beyond what people think they can reach uh, and seeing them deliver, seeing them achieve, seeing them be successful. Uh, that to me is, is, that's why I get up every day. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first episode of the Vision Podcast. I'm your host, Dylan Garcia. Well, we are trying to figure out who is in your field, what do they like, and what makes them so special. Uh, today, we'll be covering oil and gas with Mr. Jeremy Thigpen of TransOcean. He's the CEO. So hopefully, y'all guys can take some knowledge and apply it to y'all's route, but welcome. Yeah, thank you. Good to be here. The first thing I want to get started with is passion. So what I think what ripens passion is the conviction that your work matters. And so I think it's imperative that interest without purpose is nearly impossible to st- sustain for a lifetime. So I think you got to find something that you love, but also also integrally connected to the well-being of other people. So for you, Mr. Jeremy, when did you, when did you find that passion for going into oil and gas and leading that charge? That's a really interesting question. Um, I, I would say it didn't start with the passion for oil and gas. Uh, I would say it started with a passion for people. Uh, And and I never really sat back and thought, hey, I want to enter the oil and gas space. Um, I am proud of it now, and I'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, You know, honestly, in college, I thought I was going to play in the NFL, uh, naively. Um, (laughs) I thought I was going to play in the NFL. Uh, Had a pretty good college career and tried out for a few NFL teams and uh, quickly learned that they were not interested because I was just not big enough. Um, so that was a little bit humbling. And then it was, okay, what do I do now? I'm about to graduate from Rice. And um, coincidentally, unbelievably, fortunately, I had worked for a company called National Oil Well since I was 16 years old. Oh, Actually, wow. I think it was 14, but that would have violated some child labor laws. Right. So, um, but we'll say 16. And uh, I worked at the same shop every summer uh, all the way through high school and college. 16 years old. 16 years old. Uh, and uh, as I was about to graduate, I was about to take a position with Enron as a gas trader, which would have been a colossal mistake, of course, <laughs> as, as they disappeared from the planet. Um, but, uh, but before I did, the guy that ran the shop at National Oil well called me. He liked me. Yeah. And he said, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. I think maybe go to Enron. And he said, before you do that, I would like you to meet somebody. He just became a vice president. He just joined the company. He said, I think you guys would hit it off. Yeah. And so I went and interviewed with this guy who wound up being you know, my mentor, uh, and really close friend now, a guy named Pete Miller, uh, you know, Paul, oh, yeah, <laughs> uh, and, um, and he offered me a job. And, and, uh, so just, uh, just really lucky to get in the space. It wasn't really a choice. It wasn't a, a choice based on passion. Um, over, over the years, I now realize the, the value that we bring to the world. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we, we make the world a better place. We, we raise the standard of living for people across the globe. Uh, and so that gives me pride. Okay. Um, but, but more than anything, the passion for me is in the people that work with me and, and that I work with, uh, and it's making their lives better and advancing their careers and making the, the lives for their families better. That, that better, that, that to me is, is the passion, uh, and it's transferable to any space. Gotcha. Um, but that, that's what gets me excited. Yes, sir. So what would be like your reason kind of greater than reality? Like what push, pushes you every day besides, you know, helping people in oil and gas? I think, I th- think my reason greater than reality, interesting choice of words. Uh, I would say uh, f- for me, th- the most exciting thing for me is to, to establish the vision, to get people rallied around that vision, to set expectations that are beyond what people think they can reach. Mm-hmm. Uh, implementing metrics and accountability process to, so that everybody knows exactly where they stand at all times. Okay. Uh, and seeing them deliver, seeing them achieve, seeing them be successful. Uh, that to me is... is that's why I get up every day. All right, so moving on to college, you earned your Bachelor of Arts in Economics and Managerial Studies, but you also graduated from Harvard with the Management Development Program. Did you work with those two simultaneously, or how did how did that work? No, so so went through Rice, um, went through Rice, graduated Rice, started working the, the Monday after I graduated on on Saturday, uh, and um, you know, lived overseas, worked for a year at National Oil Well, moved overseas uh, to Germany, uh, was there for a year. And then moved to Scotland, was there for a year. And while I was in Scotland, I decided that I wanted to go and pursue my MBA and, and actually took my GMAT at Glasgow University uh, mm-hmm. in, in Scotland and, and did fairly well. 
And uh, my my boss, mentor Pete at the time, said, uh, apply to the top 10 schools, and if you get in, we will pay for it as National Oil Well. And when you return, you'll be an indentured servant, <laughs> essentially. <Wow. Yeah. laughs> and so I applied to the top 10 schools and got in everywhere but Harvard, okay. uh, which is where he went. And um, and so what he really meant was not apply to the top 10 schools. It was apply to Harvard Business School and get accepted, and I'll yeah. pay for it. Um, but I didn't get in, and he was upset because he didn't understand why. And so he called the dean of admissions. Mm. And and essentially the dean of admissions said, listen, we, we need to be a diverse university. And, um, and you know, Jeremy looks like a great candidate, but we've got 100 Jeremys, uh, which was, again, humbling, kind of like my NFL uh, thoughts. <laughs> but uh, but what he did say was, um, you know, we have an executive program up here, and it's only – it's a it's like a three-month um, – a three month program, but you cover a lot of the same ground as you do in the, in the MBA program. You don't get the credential of an MBA, but, um, but in terms of just uh, learning uh, and and experience, he said, it's a fantastic program. So Pete said, do you want to go up and try that? And he said, we'll keep you on salary and, you know, we'll pay for the program. And, uh, and he says, and if you, if you get done with it, if you complete the program and you don't feel like you got out of it, what you wanted, then we'll look at MBA program, you know, next year. And I went, and it could have been, it was, I mean, it was wonderful. Best experience uh, I could have had, and I didn't miss two years of compensation, uh, which most people do when they go for the two-year uh, MBA. So it, it worked out beautifully for me. I got out of it what I wanted, uh, and then some. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, so that was probably, that was in 2001, um, and I graduated from Rice in 97, so, you know, a good three and a half, four years afterward, uh, which was good because I had some good real-world life experience um, to, to, lean back upon and, 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 and utilize as I, as I went through that program. So it was a, it was a very rewarding uh, experience. And so managing like grades while playing football, you at Rice University, mm-hmm. uh, lineman? Am I, I was a lineman, yeah, I was lineman? a center. Okay. 60 pounds ago. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you, because I know I, I got a couple of friends, they're, they're playing D1, and they, they just tell me how, how much of a kind of a tr- concentration camp it is. And so like <laughs> how did you manage, you know, having your books, but then also at the same time, yeah you know, balancing those two things. It's, uh, it, it, you know, Rice is an unbelievably demanding school uh, academically. Uh, and so to, to try to excel at both is, is a challenge. Um, I'll tell you a funny story. You know Jonah, my, my middle boy. Yes, sir. Uh, he's uh, first year at Arizona State, and he wanted to walk on. And uh, I sat down with him uh, before he went, and, and uh, I said, son, listen, if you want to walk on and play football, I would love it, and I would go to every game even if you didn't play. And I said, but let me tell you what your day is going to look like. Mm-hmm. You are going to wake up at 5, 5.30. You're going to go into, uh, in, into the training center and, and you know, because you're going to have some kind of nick or bruise or yep. sprain or something. Never playing 100%. And, and you, you're going to have to do that. Then you're going to get a workout in. Then you've got to show up to training table by 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning, have breakfast, and then you go to classes until 1. Uh, and then you go back to the football facility where you get some more treatment. And then you watch film. And then you have practice. And then you get cleaned up, and then you have to go to training table for dinner. And by the time you get done with that, it's 8 o'clock. Mm-hmm. And then you have to go and study. And so you're done at maybe 10. So and it's that, yeah. it's that way every day. And as a walk-on, you're probably never going to play. You're just going to get the shit kicked out of you every day. So if that's what you want to do, I'm fully supportive. But you better make sure you love it. Right. And if you love it, great. Um, he had decided about a week later he wasn't going to walk on. He was just going to join a frat. And I think he's living his best life now in, in, <laughs> in Arizona. Yes, but, but that's kind of what the, the process was. It was you, you had to sacrifice kind of a personal life, really, right. uh, in a lot of ways uh, to, in order to manage the priorities. And the priorities were do as well as you possibly can academically and do as well as you possibly can on the field. And everything else is secondary. So it doesn't mean I didn't have friends. I did. Doesn't mean I didn't go out and party every now and then. I did. Maybe more than every now and then. Right. But but first and foremost was excel academically, excel athletically, and then everything else is kind of a, a benefit. I got you. So when you were playing those sports, you know, a lot of people say that when you are in athletics, um, it teaches teaches you many things. So what did you take from that and kind of put it into the business world? You know, th- th- there are. I gave a presentation not long ago. Um, to a group, and I'd given it maybe 10 years ago to the Jones School of Business at Rice University, mm-hmm. and it was essentially everything I needed to know in business I learned on the football field. So I would tell you everything in my life has been based on sports, um, you know, starting with, you know, setting your value system. So my first day at Rice University, and this has stuck with me forever, and I use it to this day, 
is make sure you, you surround yourself with people that carry the same values as you. And when I first got to Rice, my very first day, there was a placard in the team room, first meeting, and it read, your last name is Rice. Mm. And the head coach at the time was a guy named Fred Goldsmith, and he could see me looking up there at the placard, and he says, do you know what that means, son? And I said, no, sir, I don't. And he says, from now on, everything you do reflects on this university, positively or negatively. So if you do something stupid, like go to the marquee and get drunk and get in a fight and go to jail, in the Houston Chronicle, it's going to read Jeremy Thigpen, Rice football player. Now you've tarnished my brand, and you've tarnished the brand of Rice University. So when I hire people, I tell them that. Your last name's not Smith anymore. It's not Garcia. It's Garcia hyphen Thigpen hyphen Transocean because you're carrying my brand. Correct. Don't mess with my brand. And so surround yourself with really good people who treat people the right way uh, with respect and professionalism. Um, and, and so that was kind of the, the starting point. But then you get into strategy. How are you going to win? How are you going to win in business? How are you going to win in the game? So as Rice, a bunch of nerds, not as athletically gifted as most of the teams we played, right? right yeah. <laughs> and so how do you win? Well, our philosophy was if the other team doesn't have the ball offensively, they can't score. So we would actually – so we went to the option offense. And stay, we would actually – We long would as actually can. practice. We would actually practice with, a, with a, a, a clock, snapping the ball at one to two seconds left on the, on the time clock. And then we try to get three yards and do it again. And just keep the ball as long as we possibly could. So this is going to be my gratuitous plug. Yeah. Um, we beat the University of Texas. They were ranked in the top ten. No one expected us to win. We held the ball for over 40 minutes out of a 60-minute game. It was the, and we won 19 to 17. I mean, just barely. But it was, that was the way, that was our strategy. That was the way you win. And so once you have your strategy, you say, okay, what kind of people do I need to deliver that strategy? That to was execute that hedgehog, strategy? hedgehog concept. It was. It was basically. our hedgehog concept. Absolutely. And so everything, I mean, it, you, you know, I could take you, it's basically a, a, a McKinsey 7S model. And for those of you who've never studied that, it's an old uh, McKinsey consulting 7S. It's called the 7S model. It's basically everything that I learned in football, and it just syncs up. Um, so, I mean, I learned, I learned a ton from sports. <laughs> Gotcha. So after college, you said you went to National Oil Well and Varco? Yeah, it was National Oil Well, and then uh, years later, uh, we acquired a company called Varco, and then we became National Oil Well Varco. How did you get that connection? That was, that was again, through that, that summer internship. Well, it wasn't even an internship. That summer well, program I did. 16. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and just happened to make friends with the right guy and, uh, who introduced me to uh, Pete Miller, who hired me. He was a VP at the time. He wound up becoming chairman and CEO. And, and it was, a, it was uh, this is kind of an aside, but it was, a, it was a perfect time to get into the industry because from, say, 80, the early 80s, mid-80s to 1997, uh, it had been a, a cyclical downturn in the industry. So nothing but departures from the industry. I mean, a lot of layoffs, um, a lot of terminations, a lot of forced retirements. And so, and it wasn't an attractive industry for any new college graduates and people, companies couldn't afford to hire new college graduates anyway. And so when I arrived on the scene at National Oil Well in 1997, the company had just gone public, so it had access to capital on the New York Stock Exchange, so it had access to capital. All of its competitors um, had gone bankrupt and were selling for pennies on the dollar, and no one had been hired in the last 15 years. And so we went on an acquisition spree. I think over the, the course of my 18 years there, we acquired over 200 companies. And so we, we experienced this exponential growth and there was no one between me and a bunch of 55-year-olds. And so as Pete looked around for, for people to give opportunities to, to run new businesses or, you know, to, to grow businesses, you know, like, Jeremy, go. I don't know what I'm doing. It's all right, go. <laughs> so, it's, I mean, it was a, just an unbelievably fortunate opportunity. Right company in the right industry with the right mentor at the right time. And fortunately, you know, every opportunity I was given, I, I delivered. Uh, and so I just kept getting more. Um, so, yeah, it was just a lot of it was lucky. <laughs> Somebody maybe that doesn't have that connection, how, what would you do in their position? Uh, how would you reach out to those people that have that significant power? Yeah, no, I, th I think uh, to the extent that you can, and I know not everybody can, you know, as you, as you graduate from, from university and you're looking for an opportunity, if you can, take your time and really understand the company and the leadership team and, you know, who your particular supervisor is going to be. Um, and make sure that you feel like it's, a, it's an environment where you can succeed. Uh, and I know a lot of people can't. They just need to find a job and start generating some income. But to the extent that you can, uh, really look for, you know, a place where you feel comfortable. Because, I'm, I mean, I know a lot of people aren't this way. I am. The, the, 
life and especially your, your work-life balance, as you think about that, it's far more than just your initial compensation. It's far more than compensation in general. It is, do I feel like I have a good work-life balance? Do I feel like I have somebody that's supervising me that actually cares about my well-being right. um, and, and is really interested in progressing my career? Do I feel like I'm doing something worthwhile? Um, and I think, you know, you, you kind of take all those things, you put them together, and, and that's the key to, to a long and, and prosperous career. Um, while I'm on that topic, I'll just take an aside. The other thing that I would encourage, you know, your listeners is the other reason to take your time and find the right opportunity. I don't, I don't look at resumes anymore. <laughs> I don't. But when I did, if I saw someone that jumped companies every two to three years, I immediately threw it in the bin. Because to me, it said they probably interview well, uh, and then they get found out over that two to three years, and they're not really a performer. Or they're constantly looking for the almighty dollar, right? They're constantly looking for what's next. And so it, it's not fair because I know there are all kinds of circumstances that might lead to people changing careers. Um, but to me, that's what I read. And I'm just like, I'm, I'm not going to spend time on it. If you progress within one company over a, you know, a, a seven, eight, 10 year period, that to me, oh, okay. The people that know them, trust them. They've they delivered on their commitments consistently, which is why they got more opportunities. I like that. But, but to me, you, you kind of see people that jump around a lot. And I think you see that a lot with, with kids today, yes, <laughs> young sir. adults today. Oh, yeah. um, it's not something that, that I get excited about. You know, I, I spent 18 years with one company, and, and I got called to interview. I was the CFO at, at Innovy when I left. And I got called to interview for the opportunity to be the president and CEO of Transocean. And I said no initially. Wow. And, they, and it was like, why? And I said, because I've, I've spent my entire career here. I started out in the shop, pressure washing equipment, right. greasy and dirty and nasty, sweeping floors. And I'm now the CFO, and I am the next in line to be CEO. That's a really cool story. And, and then, you know, the person on the other end, it was Pete. He said, he said, listen, this is the largest offshore drilling company in the world. Jobs like this do not come along very often. Oh, yeah. you, you really need to rethink this. <laughs> I can only imagine. And like Nick Saban, I know he has the same philosophy. He looks at the high school recruits and he's like, if I see him transition or transfer in high school just because they're not getting looks, yeah. like he, he says he's not, not interested. I'm not interested. Yeah. So I see where you're coming from yeah. on that point. Um, what project would you say at NOV that sparked that, hey, I have like that confidence that I can go and be a CEO? I think in terms of, of potentially being a CEO, it would have been, I was 28 years old, um, and uh, I was given the opportunity to be the president of one of the, the business groups within National Oil. It was a, it was a smaller group um, in terms of j just by comparison. So it was probably... When I took over, about $175 million a year in revenue, uh, maybe 20% EBITDA margins. So not, not a big business, mostly located in, exclusively located in North America, so Canada and U.S. Um, and uh, after about a year of just kind of poking around with it and, and really getting to know the business, because I knew nothing about it when I became president. I really didn't. So I'm 28. I'm managing a bunch of guys that are 55 and older that have been in this business their entire careers. You can imagine what a challenge that was. Yeah. Um, but just kind of poking around and, and, and understanding it, I put together a strategy and presented it to, to, to Pete and our CFO at the time was a guy named Steve Kravlin. And, and it was essentially, I want to turn us into a one-stop shop for a bottom hole assembly. So everything below the surface when you're drilling mm -hmm. and uh, put together an acquisition list and some new uh, technology development and global expansion. And we grew that business from 175 million a year in revenue and 20% EBITDA margins to over 2 billion in revenue and 35% EBITDA margins. And that's when I, I thought, okay, I can, confidence. I can do this. I can do this. <laughs> For sure. So, so you would say you never really had uncertainty that you would not succeed? No, I, I, I've, I've always been confident that I would ultimately succeed. You, you know, it was, it was funny. So it, when, I, when I interviewed for Transocean, the Transocean job, um, Carl Icahn had just launched and, and won a, a proxy battle with, uh, with Transocean and got to appoint two board members. And uh, so my first interview was at Carl Icahn's office in New York. And, and for those that don't know Carl Icahn, please go Google him. And, and there's a movie out on him here recently. It's great. Uh, unbelievably unique, interesting character. Uh, unbelievably successful. Um, but I uh, went and interviewed with, uh, at his office with, with the two guys that he had appointed to the board. They were still on our board, by the way. And um, one of them asked me, he said, tell me about a time when you failed and what you learned from it. And I said, you're going to hate my answer. I said, I've never failed. 
And he says, what do you mean? And I said, listen, I have, I have failed to deliver on a commitment. I have, you know, I've missed a block. You know, I have, you know, missed a budget. And I said, but I can, I said, let me, let me put it to you this way. I said, do you like sports? And he says, yeah. And I said, do you like baseball? And he said, yeah. And I said, okay. So if you play 20 years in Major League Baseball mm-hmm. and you bat 300, you're guaranteed Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame, yeah. Right? Technically, though, you failed seven out of ten times. Yeah, it's pretty so, so I view myself like a, a hitter would, would view the game. Did I put in all the work necessary to succeed? Did I study the pitcher? Do I know his tendencies and certain pitch counts? Did I work with my batting coach? Do I make sure I have a good swing every time? And if I happen to hit a line drive into left center and the center fielder makes a diving catch, technically I failed. I'm out. But I don't view it that way. I said if I ever looked in the mirror and, and d- didn't deliver on something because I didn't work for it and I didn't prepare for it, that's a failure. And I said I've never done that and I never will. That's a solid answer. Mm-hmm. That's an impressive. He actually answer. looked at me and he says, "That's pretty freaking good." Yeah. <laughs> he used a different language, but you know, for this, I'll use freaking. So, what what would you say? You know, going on. So now you're CEO. Uh, you said how how old were you? I was forty when I became 40? CEO. Okay, yeah. so you're still young. Well, youngish. Nah. I look <laughs> sixty. Years young. I'm only I'm, years young. I'm forty eight, but I look sixty five. It's it's been a it's been a tough eight years. <laughs> So what core values did you, like, instill in your team? You know, um, obviously, you probably took some from the previous, but, you know, to try to con- transition it to your company, what did you kind of implement? I, I, I think it was a um, – I, I would say it was a broken culture when I got there for multiple reasons. Um, the, the, you know, the, the, the company had, had come through the Macondo incident, which was devastating, right. obviously. Um, they had they had gone through multiple acquisitions, um, you know, over the course of the, the, the ten preceding years, and I don't think they had done a very good job of integrating those acquisitions in terms of establishing a unified culture, in terms of uh, recognizing efficiencies, and you know, like taking out cost and, and really getting the full benefit of of those acquisitions. And they didn't have to because basically offshore drilling had been up and to the right for ten years straight. They were generating so much cash. Uh, they didn't really have to look for, you know, efficiencies, cost they didn't reductions. Have restrictions back then. Yeah. Now and, and it's all filled with restrictions, and you got to work around that and your team. It, so. And so you had basically five, six different companies under the Transocean umbrella that never really embraced each other, never really were integrated. Um, they had the, the still had the sting of, and, and recognizably so, of, of Macondo. They'd gone through the, the um, Carl Icahn uh, proxy war, which generated a lot of bad press. And so there was just a lot of noise around the organization. And, and, and so I think the, you know, the, the primary thing was just kind of the unification of the entire team um, was, was really probably the, the, the one thing that I brought more than anything else. But, but a lot of that unification came from let's decide who we want to be when we grow up, right? Mm-hmm. Here's who we are today. Who could we become given our current environment, which we know is going to be, you know, a downturn for multiple years. We don't know how many. Um, and, and so it got people in it rallied around a, a, this is who we could be and who we want to be. Uh, and now let's go and execute. And, and so I, I think establishing the vision, uh, changing out the team, really, really surrounding myself with people that are better than me, which right. isn't hard. Uh, it's easy to find people better than me, gotcha. uh, but getting them excited about where, where we could go and then holding them accountable. Um, and that, that accountability piece I think is, is really important. And, and it's, you know, growing up an athlete. You, you know, we would film everything. So you'd have a practice on Monday and Tuesday when you go into, you can't hide, you, can't hide. you go in. And even if you made the block and you got, you know, you, you sprung the running back for, you know, 50 yard gain, whatever. If your footwork wasn't perfect, if your hand placement wasn't perfect, if you didn't finish the block, you got critiqued. It's binary. It, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's zero one. Either you did it perfectly or you didn't. And more often than not, you don't do it perfectly. And, and so for me, it's not emotional. Mm-hmm. It, it's, listen, this is what you said you were going to do. This is by when you said you were going to do it. You didn't do it. How do we fix that? How do I trust you? Um, and, and so I think bringing that, that, that pro- I call it a process for accountability to the organization um, was, was probably one of the biggest, besides setting the vision, it was probably one of the biggest things that, that we did to, to kind of transform the company. And so in Good to Great, uh, you mentioned to read that book. It's also it's Good to Great by Jim Collins. It's got to read great. it. It's a good book. But it says, you know, what stopped good companies from uh, being great in the first place is that they try to stop the flywheel. And so what he meant by that is, you know, a lot of people, they try to go in. um, He says employees try to mimic their predecessors with bold visionary moves, 
think to act like a genius without being a genius and that proof is unsuccessful so maybe not more like with your with your state because it's different since that uh that incident did happen but maybe for like another entrepreneur um how do you how would you say to to keep that fly that flywheel going but at the same time uh Putting your, putting your thoughts into the company. Yeah, so it's been a while since I read Good to Great. It's a great book, but if I remember the hedgehog concept and the three circles that intersect, it's um, identify what you could be the best in the world doing. It doesn't mean you're there today, but you could be the best in the world. Identify what drives your economic engine. Like where are you going to actually make money? And what is it that people can get passionate about? And where those three circles intersect, that's where you need to focus. And so we went through that process I didn't talk about the hedgehog concept necessarily, but yeah. when I asked questions and I kind of led people to, to through this conversation, I was, I was imagining that. And so what we decided is the one thing where we could be the best in the world is Transocean was, was delivering services in the harshest environments in the world, the most complex, most challenging environments, which is ultra deep water and then harsh environment, uh, primarily in Norway. Um, but there are other harsh environment areas, but, but Norway. Uh, and and everybody got excited about that. So one, that's where we thought we could be the best in the world at delivering value. Right. Two, it's where we thought we could differentiate and actually generate an economic return. And by differentiate, I always I always view differentiation in two ways. Are you capturing more market share than your competitors? And are you able to charge a premium? Because that means your customers recognize the value that you're bringing. Um, and, and then, and that also coincided with what our, our people were passionate about. They wanted to be the technology leaders in the space. They wanted to be recognized as that. And so that was actually a pretty quick conversation. People got rallied around that mm-hmm. unbelievably quickly, but it meant we had to change who we were. Right. We had 90 rigs in our fleet when I got there. We have 39 today. Right, so how do you take that like chaos to concept? Like 90 rigs is crazy. 90 rigs to 39. We retired 65, I think floating rigs okay. and to put that in context a floating rig today would probably cost between 750 and a billion dollars to build and we just scrapped them they were older so they weren't worth, worth nearly that much but but we got really focused on we're going to have the best assets in the world in these two categories mm-hmm. and we're going to rid ourselves of all the other assets you know we played in the jack up space we played in the midwater space we played in the deep water space and we had some older assets even in the ultra deep water and harsh environment space and we got rid of all of them which was painful. I mean, that's what Kroger did with all their stores in the country. They they realized that the market was going to supermarkets, and so they they destroyed all their stores in the country, uh, costing them millions and millions of dollars. And then they they gambled on this on the idea of that. Hey, there's going to be pharmacy. There's going to be um, now now you can go take pictures or stuff like that. So mm-hmm. it's it's that type of risk that like when people say like I don't know if I want to take this risk, but there's companies out there like you. Uh, you're destroying all these. Uh, oil rigs and then you got Kroger destroying all their uh, stores and so like when people say I'm afraid to take a risk it's like do you really even know what risk is yeah to an extent and so I think if you can put that in perspective um, that'll give you more confidence going to whatever you're doing yeah, yeah and in some respects it was a risk but in some respects because of the, the the depth of the downturn and the duration of the downturn it was almost a necessity we, we had to find ways to drive cost out of our business and so it was almost an act of survival in some ways. So, it, you know, on, on one side of it, you have this passion to be this technology leader and participate in these, these high-end markets. On the other side, you have, I just don't have liquidity right now. I've got to find a way to cut costs out of my business and, and prevent this cash drain. And so the two kind of converged simultaneously mm-hmm. and gave us the impetus we needed to really take bold uh, action, which, which you just defined as risk, but it was just bold, decisive action. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure we would have been able to do that candidly in an up market because people would have been asking why. I mean, why, why would we do that? But when, when you're in survival mode, um, you can you can get a lot accomplished. I mean, necessity is the mother of invention, right? So uh, going on to like your breakthrough, um, you know, some companies, they'll go on a plateau or drought for a while. And I like an example I like to give is um, famous UCLA coach. John Wooden. John Wooden. Yes, <laughs> John Wooden. And so he before he even won 10, to 10 out of 12 championships, uh, he was on a drought for 15. He hadn't been. And so, you know, how do you even trust that coach? But then he, he finally had his breakthrough. So obviously 15 years is a lot for a company. And in the book, Good to Great, it, it said that most companies were three to five years uh, until they broke through. But even still three to five years, that's a lot of patience, a lot of uncertainty. And, um, you know, Winston Churchill, he has a, he has a great quote. It's, um, there's no worse mistake in public leadership than to hold out false hopes soon to be swept away. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, he led Britain to win the Second World War. So how do you tell your team that, hey, things are going to be okay? 
um, when things don't look okay. I think it is to to stay focused on those things that you can control and demonstrate wins in all of those things that you can control. I can't control low prices. I can't control what my customers are going to spend. Um, what I can control is what we do internally. Um, and, and so for the last eight years, and we have been through, I, I called it eight years of winter, mm-hmm. um, it, it has been tough. So initially there was so much work to be done in terms of, of, of organizational change, cost reductions, um, fleet. Not uh, only that, but like you now you have uh, res- new restrictions because of the accident. Ab- so yeah, how absolutely. Do you, so how do you tell your team like, hey, it's going to be okay. We're still going to be successful, just as successful as we were before, but now we, we kind of have to work around things. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I think to that end, in terms of the larger picture, there, there is, despite all the rhetoric um, around energy transition, sorry, guys, it's never going to happen. It's not. Uh, uh, it's never going to happen. So we, we are, and we play an unbelievably important role in society. Uh, and, and so to, to under, I'll get on my soapbox for a little while. Oh, no, I'm going I'm to catch that. I'm going to catch that. You catch it later? Yeah, I'm catch All right, it later. We, I got you, co- I promise. Okay, I promise. we can come back to that. All right. We're coming back. Uh, so I think, I think one, the, the, the world is going to require oil and gas. They're going to require our services. And if we participate in the highest end and deliver the, the highest reliability, um, the, the highest safety performance, uh, the greatest efficiency in terms of delivering a well, um, then we are going to be successful. So I think, I think that's number one. But then, then focusing on kind of the small things that we can control internally, and, and, you know, at the start of this, we met as a team, a, a large team, every month um, to review progress we were making against certain strategic imperatives. And you did not want to get up in front of all your peers and your bosses and, and say, we didn't deliver on our goals from last month, on our commitments from last month. Mm-hmm. And so it just created, again, this sense of accountability, but it also created the sense of pride. I said I was going to do that. I did it. We're making progress. I can see us getting better each and every day. It's, it's, it's funny you say that because I had probably in year two, year three, uh, I'm at our board meeting and we're in executive session. So my, my team's not in there anymore. It's just me and the board. And one of the board members says, Jeremy, you are always high energy and upbeat. How? In this market, how are you like that? <laughs> and, and it was basically that. It was, listen, I, I, we have mapped out a plan and we are delivering on everything that we said we would deliver on w- internally, with the board, with the street. And, and as long as we continue to do that, ultimately, this market will turn. Yeah. I mean, you look at history. It will always turn. And when it does, we're going to be well positioned. Now, it took a lot longer than I thought. We're finally there. We're, we're finally in recovery mode. Um, and honestly, you know, through COVID, which set us back another two years, yeah. it, it might have been the second time in my life where I felt a little depressed. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, but other than that, I'm always upbeat because I'm, I just focus on what I can control and get up every morning and work as hard as I can and, and deliver. And so Jim Collins, he says, management is failing to keep up with innovation since there's always a, a way to find <clears throat> a stand. And so it's just a matter of finding the right solution. So do you agree with that statement? Like that is, there's always a solution out there. It's just a matter of finding it. And I know it sounds easier said than done, but in a, in a CEO's pos- position, how do you, how do you a- feel about that? Absolutely. I am, again, going back to sports, I, I am, you know, if right now we're at 97% plus uptime uh, in, in our fleet, across our global fleet. You go back eight years ago, we were probably at 90%, 92%. So considerable improvement. But I'm always asking, okay, how do we get to 98? How do we get to 99? And whether that's innovation in terms of process, whether it's innovation in terms of relationships with key suppliers, whether it's innovation in terms of new technology, um, it's always about, we can always get better. So what is the next thing that we can do? And I'm proud to say, despite our liquidity challenges over the course of the last eight years, we had several technology innovation projects that we continue to to invest in and have deployed into our fleet uh, that are making us better. Uh, and now that we're getting to a point where we can start generating more free cash flow, you know, we can start to deploy more of those technologies across our global fleet, which will which will help deliver value for our customers and, again, help differentiate us. So, no, I absolutely believe that that innovation is key. I also believe, in, and this is kind of an aside, um, you ever heard Jack Welch? No, sir. Okay, so, so Jack Welch was a famous CEO. He's with GE. Um, he was CEO of the decade, I think, in the 80s and the 90s. So, yeah, he's, yeah. he's a pretty famous guy. And, and he came and spoke to us during that short stint that I was at, at Harvard Business School. And, and he said a couple of things that, that always stuck with me. But the one thing that, that I'll say in terms of the, the innovation piece, he said the only truly sustainable competitive advantage is people. The only truly sustainable competitive advantage is people. And, and the reason why is they keep you one step ahead of the competition. 
So you come out with a great technology, even if you patent it, there are ways to work around patents. And right. so somebody's going to copy you or improve upon it. You come out with a great new process, somebody's going to copy you or improve upon it. So you have to have a team of people that is constantly striving for being better, continuous improvement all the time. And I want to stay one step ahead of everybody else. So it comes down to, again, I kind of started with people. It comes down the to people. people. Yeah. You have the best team and they all share the same values and the sh- same vision and the same direction, and the same passion, same motivation. They keep you one step ahead. So innovation is, it, it's critical. If you're not, if you're not growing, if you're not expanding, you're dying. Right. Right. It's the only, it's, you have to do it to keep people invigorated. And I like how you, I like how you said people, because I know I've, I've been reading a lot of books and, and every single book says, you know, you don't, don't worry about what you're going to do. Worry about who you have. And, um, a lot of, a lot of the good companies, they said when they went great, it wasn't, it wasn't the new technology. It was the people, it was the core values that, that was implemented in the system. And that's what took them to greatness. And so Absolutely. you're saying that right now, it's just showing proof. Absolutely. That, that, it, it doesn't matter goes. what product or service you're peddling. If, if you surround yourself with really, truly great people that share the same values, aligned around the same vision, self-motivated, you're going to succeed. And you can't teach that. So. You can't teach it. Yep. Mm. So when you come around people that you know, they, they come up with you with an excuse or maybe things aren't going right in their life, um, there's plenty of examples. I have a few here. Uh, Darwin Smith, CEO of Kimberly Clark. Um, he was battling nose and throat cancer. While, while leading his company. Then you got Joel Coleman, CEO of Philip Morris. Um, he served in World War II and didn't let those, those thoughts uh, alter the way he, he's going to live the rest of his life. And then you have Coleman Mockler, CEO of uh, Gillette, uh, getting his MBA. He converted to Christianity. So when people come up with these, like sometimes excuses, what do you have to say to those people? I am a, a unbelievably, in a workplace, unbelievably unemotional person. To me, it's about the outcome. So, so when, I, when I'm talking to somebody that works for me, it is who is going to do what and by when. And the by when is very important. If I told you I was going to give you a million, million dollars, what's the first thing you'd ask me? By when. By when, <laughs> exactly. So who is going to do what and by when? And then it's very easy. It, it's, it's unemotional. It's, it's data-driven. Either you did or you did not deliver. I really don't care about the story. The stat, yeah, stats don't lie. Stats the don't film, lie. Film doesn't lie. I, I, I don't... It, you know, results equal results. You know, the, a lot of people live by results equal no results plus a really good explanation. I, I don't care about the explanation. Either either you delivered or you didn't. Uh, and so I'm not mean about it. Right. It's just, it's straightforward. It's black and white. And these guys did it. And so, yeah, yeah. I agree. And like your emotions are your emotions. So you got to learn to do your own thinking. And, um, you know, these people didn't panic. So you got to be truthful about your emotions. At the end of the day, it's just energy in motion. And so uh, use your emotions in your favor and not against yourself. So, like, so I've, had, I've had several people that have worked for me who have, who have been a quiet moment, maybe after a few beers, you know, say something like, you're scary. And I said, I, I don't understand that at all. I said, I am always upbeat. I said, I have never yelled at, cursed at, or publicly embarrassed an employee in my entire career. I'm proud of that. Never. And they said, yeah, but you have a look <laughs> and a tenor to your voice when we know we've disappointed you and we just don't want to disappoint you. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll go with that. I like that. But I, it, it's, to me, it's not emotional at all. Either, either you committed to do something and either you did it or you didn't. So I want to talk about your five-year target, your three-year picture and your one-year plan um, with Deepwater Atlas. You know, how did you kind of I- implement that into your team? Yeah. So the Deepwater Atlas was interesting as well as the Deepwater Titan. So those are the two rigs we just, um, recently took delivery of from the shipyard in, in Singapore. Those rigs were ordered on speculation, meaning they didn't have a customer contract. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this was at the height of the market back in 2014. Uh, and then in late 14, the market crashed. And these rigs were on order. And we were due to take delivery probably, if I remember right, probably in 2019. And when you take delivery, you have to pay the balance of the CapEx. And it would have been basically together combined probably $1.5 billion, which we didn't have. So we had to go negotiate with the shipyards to delay delivery. And as we were, which they didn't like, and, and we had to pay a little bit for, for the delayed delivery. But as we were going through this process, we actually saw an opportunity to upgrade the rigs to be the most uh, capable, efficient rigs in the world. And the only two rigs in the world capable of drilling in 20,000 PSI um, uh, reservoirs. 
Three point four million hook load, huh? Yeah. So the so the one point yeah so the the seventeen hundred ton three point four million pound hook load was the huge upgrade, as well as the twenty thousand psi um, pressure control equipment system. Um, but there are all kinds of other features on these rigs. These are these are the two most incredible, efficient, capable rigs in the world, and and we got lucky. Uh, we delayed it long enough. The upgrades took long enough that we took delivery. Uh, and secured contracts before we took delivery from two customers. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so um, one is currently drilling in the Gulf of Mexico. That's the Atlas uh, for, for a company called Beacon Offshore. Um, and it's on a two-year, basically a two-year contract. The other is moving right now from Singapore to the Gulf of Mexico to drill for Chevron for five years. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, they're going to be the most coveted rigs in the world because of that high hook look capacity. Uh, as well as the uh, the twenty thousand psi. And um, did did you have like those fifty miles of well be like was that uh, when you decided to upgrade or? No, I mean it was kind of a we were kind of taking a chance. Okay. I mean we we didn't have we didn't have customer orders at that point in time, but we knew that that was a that was a market that was that could grow and and grow pretty significantly. But there were no there was no technology available in the space to actually access those reservoirs. And, and so um, we thought, gosh, if we had the only two rigs in the world, I mean, that's that's pretty good industry structure, right? Right. Yeah, whenever you have 100 percent of something, yeah, um, that, that, that's uh, we don't use that word, oh. um, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so um, so no, we were we were we were really excited uh, about the about the upgrades. Certainly excited about getting the contracts for for those two rigs. And we've got we there's a very very bright future for both uh, for both assets. So we're we're glad to welcome them into our fleet. And, um, yeah, it's, it's a good place to be. Right, and it's not really a question, but, um, I mean, you also have 700 miles of electrical cabling um, that's being pulled and um, empowering a power plant of, like, I'm a big F1 guy, so when I saw it, it empowered, like, it could do 60 F1 cars on full tilt, which then translates to uh, the Falcon, or the, what was it, the Falcon? Falcon Islands? Falcon SpaceX 9, that, oh. that type of torque. For me, like, a rocket and that torque and then, like, the uh the sixty F one cars on full tilt like that's how much energy you're generating right like how do you how do you explain that you, you know it's it's uh, I'll probably answer the question or a different question than you're asking but it, to me I'm not a technical guy and so what's amazing to me is the technology that we actually deploy so y you go out on one of these rigs in the Gulf of Mexico or wherever you may be they are three football fields long mm. and you are sitting in ten thousand feet of water. And you are drilling 10,000 feet below the surface, so now you're at 20,000 feet, and you're drilling 5,000 feet across, and you're striking a reservoir all the time. You've got winds and current and waves, and you're staying on location. All right. And the technology that you deploy to do that, to me, is, I mean, it's, it's mind-boggling. Yeah. Yet, I can't fathom it still. Yet, I mean. yet, by volume, by volume, an Ozarka bottle of water costs more than what it takes for the same volume in gasoline at the, at the tank. That, that doesn't seem fair. It doesn't. It's, it's incredible the technology that we deploy in this industry, not, not just as offshore drillers, but just across the space. Um, so, no, it, to me it's inspiring because, I mean, it's just, it, it is. It's mind-boggling. I agree. Um, so you have a quote that I, that I read. And oh, I gosh. Yes. So it's, uh, each and every day I'm inspired by the team that we have at, here at Transocean. As the industry's leading offshore driller, it would be easy to simply maintain the status quo. But at Transocean, we continue to ident identify and realize new opportunities to further di differentiate ourselves in eyes of our customers. And so what I took from that is grit and, resi and resilience y'all have. And so, you know, the idea of whatever it takes, you know, I want to improve is all refrains of paragons of grit. And so, like, no matter the particular interest, no, no matter how excellent you already are, you're still striving for, th for that next chase and so I really like that quote, and that just speaks volumes of what, of what you are as a CEO. So yeah, and I think it's it, again kind of goes back to to the sports background, but it, but it's across the space. It's not just in terms of innovation like technology. It's it's innovation and process. It's it's looking for opportunities to eliminate waste. So you know, I came from a manufacturing and distribution type of business. So in manufacturing, lean manufacturing, you're always looking to eliminate waste. In distribution, your margins are so lean that you always have to look for opportunities to drive waste out of the, out of the system so you can capture more, more margin, more cash from, um, from your sales. And, and so for me, it's always, how do, I, how do I find that next thing? And I think we've kind of implemented that throughout the organization. 
and no matter what you do, you can always find a way to contribute a little more each day, right? right? You can always find a way to be a little more efficient. You can always find, hey, how can we how can we turn this manual process into something that's automated? Um, and, and so I think we've we've got that across the organization, and it's inspiring. It's what's kept us alive. Uh, and again, uh, self promoting plug. We're the only publicly traded offshore drilling company that did not file for Chapter Eleven and go bankrupt. Uh, and and candidly, we probably should have been the first. Um, and, and so that to me is inspiring. Major, and that was major flex. And that was that was major flex. By the way, <laughs> drop the mic. Um, but uh, but but that's a, that's a true testament to the entire organization, top to bottom, all the way across every function we have. Everybody just kind of rallied around. Let's just let's just find a way to be better every day. Uh, and that, to me, is what's what's inspiring. That's what it's all about. It doesn't matter what industry you're in, what what products or services. That that's the that's what gets me going. It's the way it should be. It's that innate talent. Mm. But um, wrap up the interview. Uh, I went to. I live in Austin, so I went up to the engineering center um, at UT. Asked a bunch of other engineers, the petroleum and electrical. Um, and so I have a couple questions. I attended the IEDC, uh, International Association of Drilling Con- Contractors. Uh, like meeting and I just kind of sat there and figured out what kind of problems y'all are dealing with so I can kind of be more down to earth with you. And then uh, those people came out uh, out of SPE, the so- Society of Petroleum Engineers. But the first question is, and here's your, uh, your soap opera box. <laughs> soap opera box. Do you plan on stop drilling rigs in the future because of the new renewal energy? And can you clear that up? Um, I'm going to give my take on it first because <laughs> I did, I did hear some things, but like a lot of people... They think, you know, I'm buying energy, uh, electric cars, but, you know, these Chinese companies, uh, they're producing right now, probably as we speak, more coal, more coal mines, more coal mines. And then they're doing the same thing in Africa with these kids drilling uh, or looking for aluminum um, for these solar panels. And so ridiculous that like, hey, we're going renewable, we're saving energy. But like, first of all, the electric grid couldn't even keep up with um, if everybody converted to electric. So give your take on on why, on why uh, natural gas is never going away. I'm going to try to be good here um, and, and Go be politically for correct. <laughs> for, for whatever reason, I have no idea. I think it's ignorance. Um, the oil and gas space has been demonized by the public. And, and I think it really started in Europe and maybe Scandinavia and then, and then has made its way across over to, to the U.S. Uh, and other parts of the world. Um, I, I, I do think it's, it's based on rhetoric and ignorance not based in fact. So let's just talk fact. Um, you go back to 1970, there were three points. I'll get the numbers wrong, but directionally it's right. Okay, right. so just bear with me. Don't try to go fact check me, but directionally it's right. Um, go back to 1970, there were 3.7 billion people in the world. You go back to last year, we're closer to 8 billion, maybe even slightly above. You look at energy consumption per capita, and it has gone up every year over that time span. Right? Mm-hmm. Because people want a higher standard of living. You look out at projections for 2050, and it's 10 billion people. The majority of that growth is occurring in in Africa, India, and China. So the majority of the population growth is happening there. They are they are what's considered non OECD countries, so non developed nations. So they're they have a lower standard of living. They want a higher standard of living. And do you think that those countries actually care about their carbon footprint? No. So. It is, going to take, there, so. it is going to take a fortune and a lot of time for, for the developed nations, let's call them Europe, Scandinavia, U.S., Canada, Australia, um, to migrate and transition, if you will, to a, a higher percentage of renewable than they, they do today. And that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. It's going to be slow, and it's going to be expensive. That's going to be more than offset by Africa and India and China. Um, so the future for oil and gas is our lifetimes right. and beyond. Um, that's one thing. And, and two, we shouldn't feel bad about that. I mean, we, we, we create a higher standard of living for people around the world. It's not just fueling your cars, folks. I mean, everything you can, you see and use every day comes from hydrocarbons. Uh, and we shouldn't feel badly about that. Now it's incumbent upon us uh, as, you know, offshore drillers and oil field service companies and EMP companies, to do everything we can to deliver our service in a more environmentally friendly way. And we are doing that through technology, through process, um, through, through just sheer focus. Um, but what we do, we shouldn't, we shouldn't apologize for it. 
we, we deliver an unbelievably valuable service. And by the way, the, the hypocrisy from the developed nations Oh, yeah. who built it's their entire terrible. economies on, on energy provided from hydrocarbons <laughs> to now say that you can't develop your economy and you can't right. improve your standard of living. Hypocrite. It, it, it's, it, it's the peak of hypocrisy. Yeah. Um, so sorry, I'll get off my soapbox. I, I look at this, here's my word for it. It's not energy transition, it's energy expansion. If, if, if the population is going to grow from 8 billion to 10 billion over the course of the next 20 years, we are going to need every source of energy available to us. Every source. Um, and I agree with your point. If, if you look at the, the minerals required to, uh, the rare earth minerals required to uh, go into batteries for electrification, right. you're going to tell me that's not environmentally disruptive? Mm -hmm. Exactly. It, it's either <laughs> mining or deep sea bed, uh, it's basically vacuum cleaning, uh, deep sea bed minerals, which disturbs the, 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 the seabed as well, right? You're going to find a reason that something is environmentally unfriendly in anything you do, you tell me windmills are friendly to the environment. You gotta cut. They can't even. I mean, the come on. They can even, You gotta cut them up and then bury those. Yeah. So, so again, I, I view this more as I, th I think there's a lot of emotion and rhetoric around this energy transition. I think it's physically impossible. It's impossible, <laughs> and I think we're going to need every source of energy we can. And I think every source of energy that we develop is going to have a negative environmental impact. But it's up to us to try to to try to lessen that effect. Right. Right. Um. All right, I'll step down from my soapbox now. Okay, so the next question <laughs> uh, is, how do you feel about technolo technological advances in coding towards the process of removing humans from the workforce just for simpli simplifications and steps towards perfections for the safety of the job? Yeah, I think it's absolutely necessary, and we've done that over the course of the last uh, eight years. During this downturn, it, it was almost, again, necessities the mother of invention. We had to find ways to drive cost out of our business. Um, so take, for instance, this is just one example. One of these rigs, like the Atlas or the Titan that you were mm -hmm. referencing, they come with 200 beds. So guess how many people we have on those rigs? 200. 200. Why? It's like my wife's closet, <laughs> right? If I give her a bigger closet, she's going to fill it up. Oh, yeah. Right? So, so during, this, during this downturn, we actually looked at where we spend the most money. And, and uh, Cruz is one of the, the areas. And, and so, you know, as we started looking at that, we said, let's do a day in the life of every position on the rig and see what they're really doing. And what we found was we could probably reduce the crew from 200 to maybe as low as 135 mm. and ask people to wear some different hats every now and then. Um, we haven't gotten down that low. We've gotten down to about 150, let's say. Um, again, round numbers, please don't fact check me. Yeah. Um, but again, that's considerable. You, you, as you as you remove people from the rig, not only yeah. do you reduce costs, but you you remove people from harm's way, and so you actually improve safety, which is right. what we found. And it's like working them, working them like like you hire five, you work them like ten, and you pay them like eight. Yeah, is what's kind of what I've I've seen before. So 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 you know, on the rig we've seen it. Uh, on on the shore base we've seen it, where we had a lot of manual processes. We've now found a way to automate them. Um, and, and so, you know, one of two things can happen. Um, you know, sometimes you reduce the headcount associated with that. Sometimes you re just redirect that headcount to focus on things that are more value uh, creative. Uh, and, and so, yeah, we're constantly looking for opportunities to do more automation. Uh, not, not only is it, does it reduce cost, but oftentimes it improves efficiency. And safety. Um, so. And safety. Uh, and, and so, yeah, we need to do that. Hopefully it leads to additional growth so that people that are displaced in that process have other opportunities within the organization. It doesn't always work that way, and you just have to be honest with it. It's, it's not a – I mean, it's, it's my least favorite part of the job right. is, is, you know, informing someone that they have to go home and tell their families that they don't have a position anymore. That's, that's the worst part of this oh, yeah. job. Um, but you, you have to think about the other, you know, in our case, 6,000 employees that you have, and, and you're trying to do the best thing you possibly can for them. Right. And another question is uh, – he said a lot of businesses, a lot of businessmen are CEOs, um, but in your in your case, you know, you didn't, you were not an engineer, <laughs> um, and so, so his question was, from the engineer standpoint, how can he fulfill that goal of getting to that CEO level? Yeah, I, I would I would share with him the same thing I've shared with my kids as they were going to my two boys are in, in at university now. One's a third year at University of Houston, one's a first year at Arizona State. And, you know, when they asked me what field they should pursue, uh, I said, listen, the world revolves around money. 
and, and I said, while it may not be the most interesting um, avenue to pursue, whatever you decide, you should have a, a strong background in accounting and finance. Um, and, and so whether it's a, you know, a business degree or an accounting degree, finance degree, um, or just a minor in one of those, I, I would suggest, you know, you know, if you study engineering now, maybe do some, some work in, in business and, and accounting and finance and, and, um, and, you know, he, he can position, he or she can position themselves better for, for an opportunity like that. I got you. Thank you. And then, uh, one guy was like, what are your thoughts on internships at Transocean for engineers in college? You know, are y'all open to the idea? And if so, uh, what, what would that work consist of? Yeah. So we have, we have, um, we, we had to pause it or at least downsize it during the downturn because we just didn't have the money to do it. Um, but we have, um, reinitiated the, the internship program. We had a smaller version over the course of the last couple of years, but I think we're going slightly larger this year, maybe double the size. Uh, and, and so, you know, internship programs for technical, um, folks could be, um, I mean, across the board, uh, it could be in a supply chain type of capability or type of role. It could be in technical support where you're actually, you know, with a crew that's monitoring real time, the rigs remotely. Uh, and, and providing them uh, advice and, and approvals for certain critical operations. Uh, I mean, it, it could be in our innovation group where we're developing and deploying new technologies. Uh, all kinds of all kinds of opportunities that are unbelievably interesting. We've we've got these just I mean just they're badass. It's the only way I can describe it. Um, training facilities uh, where we've got simulators for for actually if, for lack of a better word driving the boat right. right. Uh, and, and so the just really unbelievable um, unbelievable technology. At, at, uh, at the company. So there's hope. My yeah. UT engineers, there's hope. Again. <laughs> um, and then are there any environmental consequences worth drilling in Alaska? So we did. Uh, probably my second or third year there, um, we drilled for Shell in Alaska. Uh, we did an unbelievable job, candidly. Very safe, reliable, efficient, no problems. They got a dry hole. <laughs> and so they we, we pulled the rig out. It, it was just... Um, uh, reservoir didn't pan out for him, uh, and so I, I don't know. I, I don't know that there's going to be much in the way of drilling up there. There are you. plenty of other areas. And then the last question is: uh, Is being CEO worth it? Worth the workload, or would you rather be in that CFO position? In regards of you know the quality of life. Yeah, I much prefer the CEO role. Okay. All right. So this is uh, this is a bit of an aside. So so most of my career, I was not in in the financial side. I was in operating. Uh, I was in the operations side. So I, I was the the president of uh, multiple businesses within NOV, and I really really enjoyed that. Um, uh, Pete came to me and said, "I'd like you to move into this role. I think it'd be a good developmental role. It's not your long term role, but it would be good uh, for multiple reasons. One of them was just to get a better relationship and more familiarity with with Wall Street." Uh, and, and all the analysts that covered us and, and investors out in the, in the space. And he was right. Um, but I much prefer to kind of man, manage the business holistically. As I think about the difference between a CEO and a CFO, I, I actually said this to, to my boss after Pete, the, the guy that was CFO for a long time and then became CEO when I became CFO. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I said, being the CFO is like being the mom of a family. And he says, what do you mean? And I said, you know, dad goes off to work and he's, you know, shaking hands and kissing babies and, you know, doing his job, her right. job. Um, and mom keeps everything running at home. She knows when the kids are sick. She takes care of them. She gets them off to school. She makes their lunches. She knows when things aren't going right with them and they're having drama with their friends and she takes care of it. And she knows dad doesn't want to hear about it, mm -hmm. but she takes care of all of it. That's the CFO role. The CFO role, you know, on a Monday morning, you get the general counsel, the VP of internal audit, and the co chief compliance officer walk in your room at the same time, and you just go, oh, crap, what happened? Oh, shit. And the CEO doesn't want to hear about it. That's dad. Da right. Dad's off doing his thing. Uh, and so the CFO's role is a very challenging role. You got to put up with a lot of shit. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and you got to deal with it. All right. um, and so I much prefer this role <laughs> to okay. the CFO role. I got you. <laughs> Well, thank you for your time. Uh, I had fun doing this. It was a much anticipated Likewise. podcast. I've been trying to get this together for, for quite some time. So thank you, Mr. Jeremy. Cheers. Cheers. Go Astros. Go Astros, <laughs> baby. That'll do it, guys. I appreciate y'all tuning in. Um, I'm not sure when the next podcast will be out because Oops. I will. Now you're good. <laughs> I will be in school. So I've been trying to totter school and this at the same time. And it's been it's been a pain kicking my ass. So uh 
in the summer, definitely I will have more consistent uh, podcasts. But until then, thank y'all for tuning in and I will catch y'all on the next one. Great. Thanks. Thanks.